In Pit Lane is brought to you by Nick Star Racing. Support Nick Shembury and his campaign to the 2019 British Supercar Grand Prix. Be a part of the future. And with thanks to the following show supporters. decades, the annual Phillip Island Historic Classic has been a yearly highlight of the Victorian motorsport calendar. Usually held the week before the Australian Grand Prix at Albert Park, the Historic Classic attracts motorsport fans, drivers and cars from right across Australia and all over the world. Whether it's on the track or in the car parks, there's never any shortage of things to see and do at the meeting. In fact, just finding the time to do and see everything is a major challenge in itself. The 2019 edition of the Classic once again attracted another large crowd over all three days, with fine weather making for a great weekend of racing. Although international numbers were somewhat down this year, there was still plenty of interest in those who did make the long journey. This car was one of the most popular. The Cooper Maserati T61 was driven back in the day by British Grand Prix and sports car race Roy Salvadori. In 1964, as sports cars began to appear powered by big American V8s, this car was the European answer and was the last car that Salvadori ever drove. After many years as a museum piece, it's now thankfully back on the track in the hands of Michael O'Shea. It's one of 15 T61 chassis which Cooper built around in the early 60s, mated with um, uh, a Maserati 5 litre 4 cam Le Mans engine, of which they built five of them. But it's the only one in this configuration with that engine going into that chassis. Well, tell us a bit about the history of that particular engine. As you say, there was only a few of them made. Was it a successful engine? <laughs> in true Maserati style, it was phenomenally quick but not reliable and uh, it, put up its, it put up some fantastic speeds at Le Mans, but it never finished the 24 hours. So there was four engines built prior to this one, uh, two for Carroll Shelby and two for Frank Simone. And they started at four litre, and then this size just under five litre, and then one was just over five litre in 1965, and unfortunately, Kasner killed himself in that one. It was too quick. So how did you end up getting the car? I'm a Maserati fan. And uh, when I saw this come up, it, was, it had been in the Rosso Bianco Museum for 26 years in Germany. Um, it hadn't even been started for the last 20. It was just a static exhibit looking very tired and very neglected. And uh, when I heard it was coming up for auction, I had my hand in the air at the right time. Being that it is so rare and it is such a, a classic, I mean, is there any sort of uh, backlash about the fact that you're taking it out there onto the track and uh, give, making it do what it was made to do? Yeah, some people turn around and say, well, surely you don't properly race it, do you? You just take it gently around the circuit and that. And I sort of said, yes, that's, that's what, just what I do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was built to race. I tell you, on the straight, my foot is firmly down on the right-hand side and uh, as fast as it goes. And it's still building up speed at the end of the straight. So what's this performance like around Phillip Island? What's it like to drive around here? It loves straights, so when you come on to the end of this and you can see that there's no more kinks for a little while, it's glorious, and it's just blast it straight down. Um, and, and then you come into turn two, and that's more tricky, and it's a double apex bend, and I'm little, still struggling a little bit, but I'm getting the hang of that one now. But um, yeah, the bends slow it all down, and then the straights enable me to get up the speed again. But it's good. It's a, it's a lovely circuit, and it's nice and wide as well, so you can overtake. Another visitor to the Phillip Island Historic Classic was German driver Ria Sutter in the 3.8 litre Jaguar E-Type. The winner of the 2018 Spa 6 Hour Classic race, Ria was thrilled to be in Phillip Island and caught up with in pit lanes, Craig Gladigau. Well, my dad bought it 
six years ago, but before it was about 30 years in a company from us for a customer we looked after. So it's been in the family a long time. It certainly has by the sound of things. And uh, it's not uh, sitting there laid up under covers in the garage these days. It's out and about racing and you've been racing it for a while. Yes, I'm racing it now for about, this is my sixth year now, and I'm racing it all over Europe because I'm from Germany. So we race it in the Netherlands, Belgium, England, yeah, all over the world there. <laughs> Racing's in your blood just like your dad then? Yes, he retired now racing, but yes, it comes from there. And you not only race this, you also race uh, another car as well too. Yeah, I race a little bubble car, an Austin A30. And uh, what made you come to Australia? How did you end up here? Well, the Australians uh, invited me and the other German, or English actually, and we came over in a big container and they invited this car, the Cobra, the Ferrari and the Maserati over there. And um, yeah, so we all came here because they were so kind to invite us. Exquisite company. And uh, how are you faring overseas with the uh, racing circuit over there in the series? In, in uh, Europe, it's very nice racing. It's different. We have championships, so not one-offs, I think. And it's very interesting racing. And how are you faring? How's the championship going for your standings? Well, last time, the last season, which is just finished, and this season starts when we come back in Paul Ricard in France. So last season was quite good. We won our part of it. And, uh, well, we go again when we come back and see how it goes this season. And uh, how does Phillip Island, Australia, compared to overseas? Do you, uh, do you like the track down here? Have you got the, uh, got the feel for it? Oh, I love the track. It's a great track. It's very flowy and very interesting. It's just a brilliant track with loads of ups and downs. The quality of the tarmac is perfect and it's really nice track, really good. You're watching In Pit Lane from the 2019 Phillip Island Historic Classic. When we return, one of Australia's most famous race cars, the man who bought it and the man who made it famous. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Support Nick Shembury's campaign for the 2019 British Supercard Grand Prix. Sponsorship packages now available. Join me on my journey to the British Supercard Grand Prix. Be a part of the future. Welcome back to Phillip Island and the 2019 Phillip Island Historic Classic. Although famous international cars are such an important part of the success of the Classic, for a large slice of the local crowd, these are the cars that excite the senses. The Group A and C Heritage Touring Cars sees the return to the track of some of the country's most famous touring cars. For many, the most famous are the cars of the Holden Dealer Team. This car has been bought by Western Australian historic racer Paul Stubber, and it was driven in the day by John Harvey. Both were at the island, so why not have the man who owns it have a chat with the guy who originally drove it. My name's Paul Stubber. I'm uh, fortunate enough to be the owner of this car and, and, and uh, the ex um, HDT car that uh, John Harvey was the primary driver of for, for uh, I think, really for three years from 77 to 79. And you were one of the primary movers in the, um, in the HDT, so you went straight on to the Commodore then after that, I, I guess, John. Yeah, that's true. And uh, you might say, well, sorry to lose the. Uh, the this model but uh, you've got to move on with the, the times and we were looking for extra speed and we weren't going to get it out of the old car so we got it out of the new car. And I, I certainly um, have a little bit of a history of some of the gear here but um, you had a, a memorable win at the Rothmans 500 I think it was at Oran Park am I right? Where there was a bit of a fuel issue and you, you showed that you also had a good pair of legs John is that a story you want to go back to? Well I don't mind no yeah, that, that's correct. It ran up. I was waiting for the team who would have the uh, able to calculate the miles that we'd done and therefore the use of fuel. And I'm waiting and waiting and I'm looking at the fuel gauge, which you could never trust them in a race car because they bounce around a little bit on, you know, run off the road a little bit and things like that. And so I never took any notice of that. But I looked at it once or twice, it was on empty. And I thought, well, we must be getting pretty close, but there's no flag coming out come in the next lap anyway it ran out of fuel so I uh, thought, what do I do now you know I'm embarrassed you know I think I was in second place at the time so I ran all the way back up because we were the furthest part of furthest away from the, the pits so uh, I went up there I got a churn then of course when it was empty it was easy to carry but when it was full of petrol it was hard work so all the way back down the hill to the car put the fuel in it, 
put the, then put the churn back in the car because couldn't leave it lying out there and do all that sort of stuff and, I, and get going again, which I did. And then I thought, well, I've done it now. I'm last and I'll just as, as far as I'll get, maybe pass a couple of the slower cars. But as it turned out, a couple of the cars spun, uh, had flat tyres, uh, broke something. I'm counting these cars are falling by the way, so I thought to myself at one stage, ha, 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 I could win this, but it was a ha, ha, ha. Well, I'll tell you what, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> I won the race. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would have to think that's a fairly unique story in motor racing, but uh, and it's a classic case of never give up. So, um, But you, you raced this car for three years, and um, you actually uh, knew one of the chaps that um, helped restore it and get it back in, and uh, you were around, actually, when I went, as introduced to the car to, to purchase it, you come along, um, and yourself and John Shepherd verified it was the correct car, and um, you've watched us <coughs> over the years, raced it a couple of times, and you've had the pleasure of racing it uh, once or twice yourself, John, when you were still keen to have a pedal behind the wheel. Yeah, I enjoyed the car. It was a fabulous car, and uh, I guess it still is. It looks every bit as good as it was when I drove it, and here it is all those years later. You own it, and it's perfect, and I, I really am impressed. And, and we've had a lot of pleasure with it too. We don't race it as much as we used to, but I think we're probably acknowledging the fact that we don't... I, I've been fortunate, I, touch wood, I, I've never actually taken a corner off it or banged it off, you know, and it, it's, uh, as I said, it's still in pretty much a... Um, I can very comfortably say it, a lot of the gear, we haven't changed things like shocks and springs. I've acknowledged that the car was built by the dealer team. It, it never got uh, much stuff. It's still got the, the Coney shocks on the front, the Bilstein's on the back, uh, the, the, the right size springs, all the stuff that the dealer team had in at the day, the catch cans. It's, it's, I believe it's pretty authentic and uh, it was good enough for you to win in John, so it's, it's given me a bit of pleasure as well. Well, you're right about everything you said, and it was good that it, it, it was like that, the way it was in its original condition, it still is, and uh, to, to uh, well, you, you own it, you know it's just a lovely car, and probably one of the best uh, race cars of an era, another era that's worth keeping, and you've got it. The 2019 Classic celebrated the 50th anniversary of Formula Ford. The 1600cc Kent engine cars have become one of the most successful and fastest growing classes in local historic racing. English drivers Mark Durazaria and Oliver White race historic Formula Ford in Europe and they made the long journey to Phillip Island to run for the Acuri Australia team of local owner driver Chris Davison. It's a, it's a privilege to race here, I've absolutely adored every moment. Uh, we had a day of testing yesterday and uh, I was a little bit scared of the circuit if I'm honest because it, it's just so quick, uh, you've got corners over the brow of hills and you thought oh I'm not going to get my head around this but the more laps we've had the more we've got into it and uh, yeah it's just, been, it's just been a ball, we've had a great time so far. Well, all of this track would be a bit of a walk in the park for you because you raced last year at Mount Panorama. Not only for your first time out did you uh, did you ma master it, you actually won races there as well. And you've won races here this morning. Tell us, what are your opinions of uh, Phillip Island? Yeah, I've been really impressed with the quality of the circuit. The, the tarmac's so smooth, the kerbs are really good. Yeah, it's a world-class facility. And it's a very fun track to drive as well. You, neither of you had any sort of you know, run-ins with our local wildlife yet, the Cape Barren Goose or anything like that? What we did do, last night we went to see the penguins uh, uh, at Phillip Island, which was an absolute hoot. It we had a really fine. good time, did, yeah. so, uh, yeah. Now, come on, be honest. Are they? Are the penguins, are they or are they not the most overrated tourist attraction in the world? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was trying to think of a diplomatic answer, but, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's commercialisation like I've never seen for a, for a nature event. It's really good, though. What people don't realise is we only go down not to see the penguins, but to go watch the Japanese too. Well, I, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. yeah. So what are you uh, What are you running this weekend here at Phillip Island? I'm running a, a, a Van Diemen. Um, it's 1988. It's it's uh, owned by Brian Sewell, uh, who encouraged me to come over. Uh, the association that we've got is that we met Chris Davison um, in the UK a few years back, and he's he's been coming over to Silverstone for the last two or three years. Every time he comes over, he says, you've got to come, you've got to come and race at Phillip Island. So uh, eventually my arm got twisted enough and we came over, but I'm really glad. I'm really glad we came. Of course, the thing is that Formula Ford as a historic category is growing massively around the world. 50 years, of that. what's the scene like in, uh, in Europe in general? I know it's very, very strong in England, isn't it? 
Yeah, I think it's probably a bit stronger down here, but in England now there's the new Heritage Championship, which is growing. Yeah, and I think it's definitely some of the best racing in the world. This is the 2019 Phillip Island Historic Classic on Australia's longest running motorsport magazine show in Pit Lane, celebrating 23 years on air. When we come back, what's on this weekend in Melbourne and two unique and very different classic sports races. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. What's on in motorsport brought to you by the Motoring Diary, your must-have guide for all motoring enthusiasts. Coming up this weekend in local motorsport, it's off-street drag racing at its very best with Fast Friday at Calder Park. With the track lightning fast for the recent King of the Hill meeting, expect to see some fastest ever times as Melbourne's quickest street cars and bikes take to the famous Calder Park quarter mile. All cars and bikes are welcome, gates open at 4.30pm, racing starts at 6 and yes, you can enter on the night. Bryant Park in your lawn is the site of round four of the Victorian Hill Climb Championships. At around 1.4 kilometres, the Bryant Park venue is the best, most modern hill climb track in Australia. And with all the state's top cars out for the weekend, you can guarantee some great action. Best news is that admission is free, so you've got no excuses not to get out there and take a look. A busy weekend at Sandown, Saturday the Mark Sports Car Club runs their Super Sprint Series, while Sunday it's the Porsche Club's turn with their annual Sandown 360 regularity event. And the Rotary Club of Pakenham runs the Pakenham Motorsport and Car Show at the Tumuk Reserve, Princess Highway in Pakenham. Throughout the 1960s and into the early 70s, sports racers dominated international motorsport. Series like the famous Can-Am and the World Endurance Championship ushered in a golden era of sports car racing. Ferrari were of course an important part of that scene, but not only with the cars they produced themselves. Their engines powered other cars, like the Dulondino, a visiting driver, Keith Martin. The car we've got is called a Dulon, D-U-L-O-N, which was named after the two directors, Bill Longley and Andrew Duncan. Dulon, D-U-L-O-N. It's a sports racing car with a Ferrari two-litre V6 engine. Uh, Dulon were very successful in the early 70s, making single-seater cars, Formula Fords and Formula 3, and the sports cars were a bit of an experiment. They only made four Group 6 cars, we've got two of them. This one is the Doulon Dino, as I said, with the Dino engine, uh, and we have a lot of fun with it. So what's the car like to drive around Phillip Island? Well, it, it, it's a wonderful circuit for one thing, the variety of corners uh, is superb. The car itself is dead easy to drive. It, uh, it's lovely to drive, it, it's easy, brakes are good, handling's good, it responds to adjustment, which is a sign of a good chassis. Uh, all in all, it's great fun. And the, the, the variety of corners, most of them are sort of left hand. And in Europe we're used to clockwise circuits, so everything's the other way around. But I suppose being in Australia, it would have to be the other way around, wouldn't it? Like the water in the toilets. <laughs> I've heard that. Now, tell us about the uh, about your collection of cars. I mean, you said you've got a couple of these. Are they the only two cars you've got, or have you got more in the collection? Well, I've got another one, Group 6 car, which is one of these sports racing cars, Doulon, with a Porsche engine. In fact, that one, and we go back a long way, because I was a mechanic for that actual car way back in the day, 1971, and I've known it all its life. Uh, so we'll keep that one. The other thing toys I've got is a Norton Dominator motorcycle and a World War II Jeep which is also great fun to drive. What sort of uh, meetings do you do in the uh, in the UK and over Europe? Do you run this many times over the year? Yes in Europe we do a thing called the Masters which is an FIA historic championship and the races for these cars will be like an hour long with a compulsory pit stop so you'd like to do a dummy pit stop it's to simulate the long distance races of years gone by when these cars were actually racing. That, uh, well, that wouldn't be a cheap exercise, I wouldn't imagine. Uh, you're dead right. Nothing in motorsport is cheap. Even if you don't prank the car, you're forever working on it, trying to check things and tyres and fuel and brakes and everything else. It's all fairly expensive, yes. Of course, what you're doing, apart from having a lot of fun, of course, is your protecting the history and preserving the history of the sport into the future with the cars so complicated now and so many one-make series and 
Do you think that that's going to be the case in the future? Can you see sort of the current generation running around getting all excited about a, a current era you know, one make Formula 2 car? That's a good question. Uh, I'd like to think we can get a lot more young people involved because old fellas like me remember the cars in period, but of course the younger generation don't. So they're just interested in the cars in themselves. So we, we try and bring on the young people, and there are in fact, certainly in Europe, there are quite a lot of young drivers driving these cars, and they're blending quick as well, so <laughs> they keep us on our toes, certainly. Here in Australia, sports cars were also very popular, and Australia had its own local marks to take on, and in many cases, beat the best in the world. Elfin is of course famous for its Formula 5000s, but they also produce some of the most successful sports races ever. This is one of the rarest. The Ford-powered 1966 Globe Racing Elfin 400 Cobra. This one was uh, actually the first chassis, but the second one that was completed. Four were made. Um, the first one was uh, this uh, Globe Products car. And Glow Products were a South Australian company used to make mag wheels, actually, or they were really noted for. Uh, the first car to actually be completed was the Elfin 400 for Frank Maddich, which was uh, called the Traco Oddsmobile. And the uh, third car was Bob Jane's. And Bob Jane's had a Repco Brabham. Uh, it's actually interesting that it was the first Repco Brabham to be fitted into a car other than one of Jack's. Uh, this, uh, the fourth one then went to New Zealand uh, for Andy Buchanan. And this one, I guess, is the one that uh, was first uh, ordered, first produced, but not the first completed. Um, it had a, a history with uh, Glow Products and Noel Hurd driving it, then uh, Keith Rylestone for a short time, then changed hands to Stan Keen, a South Australian. Uh, it actually took a hill climb championship, um, which actually I think the, the record time stood for over a year. And then it went Tasmania to Max Thompson who campaigned it uh, quite a lot and uh, had a couple of shunts. First one was repairable, the second one wasn't, and it then went uh, in the hands of Bert Howard, returned to the Elfin factory while Gary Cooper was still alive, and went to uh, be completely restored, but restored to 1980 level. Uh, it had straighter side pontoons, it had reinforcement around the chassis, and a lot of change to make it up to the minute. Uh, it then didn't do a lot of work for about 20 odd years and uh, I uh, discovered it five years ago and uh, negotiated with Bert, bought it and then spent the last five years putting it back to how it was in 1966. The side pontoons were re-rolled to the right diameter and we had some old Elfin employees who are in retirement and were able to give us a hand to uh, get it looking right. Uh, even into the engine bay was uh, changed and modified, I put it back to how it was due to photographs by Ron Lambert, who actually took photos while he was working at Elfin on how the actual car looked. So we are able to actually represent it as a 1966 car, and even the colour, which is really quite odd for 1966, it's the same colour as the owner, uh, Dick Bassett's Jaguar S-Type, and a uh, powder blue Jag. Yeah, initially this car was actually a, a prototype mule for Glow Products who were actually developing a quad cam head for a Falcon, uh, for, for the sort of GT Falcon and for an upgrade as if you'd needed more power on one of those. But um, they were developing, Keith Drage was actually the driver behind that, a fantastic engineer that actually was involved in the Clisby project which is making a Formula One engine again in an elephant some years earlier. So this was the mule that was going to test that quad cam engine. Now it was on the dyno, it produced big power, but unfortunately it just needed more development. So they transposed between the quad cam engine and the normal Windsor um, 289. I think Noel Heard, the first driver, reminded me that the 289 was only in this car for a few events and they went then to a 302 block. So uh, I've maintained that, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's the same block, but it's a 302, uh, very early 302 Windsor block. Uh, the replacement heads are, are in period heads that you can now uh, buy again. And uh, uh, basically it's uh, got a very, uh, well I'd say a mild cam, very tractable for an old bugger like me to try and drive because um, you don't need it too peaky. And this thing really it drives like, a, like an automatic. If you're in the wrong gear at the wrong corner, it doesn't really matter. Well, we hope you've enjoyed the 2019 Phillip Island Historic Classic and we hope to be back again to cover it in some way in 2020. Next week, we'll be back in the studio for In Pit Lane Live and the start of our 24th year on air.
So please join us and remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's free. And you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter and even Instagram. Whatever Instagram is. So until next week from all of the team at Inpit Lane, it's bye for now.